as a as a teacher and as um uh, you know, having a handful of disciples, I am concerned about whether or not they represent me well or not so well. Mm. Oh, look, I mean, I mean, part of this is is healthy, but part of it can be unhealthy. I mean, even in the in the in the uh, phenomenal world out there, I mean, I spent all those years at Harvard. Okay, two master's degrees and a doctorate from Harvard. Well, I had finished my dissertation and my advisor, my doctoral mentor said, I think you need to stay here one more year. I thought I was finished. He said, I think you need to stay one more year. Harvard doesn't want to let anyone leave unless they feel they have completely they're completely capable of representing Harvard level scholarship. Well, I mean, you know, okay. So in the same way, I, I will admit that there's a careful balance. On the one hand, I want my students to represent my teachings properly and not misrepresent me. But on the other hand, I also have to respect that they are at certain levels of immaturity and levels of growth that through which they must go. So I can't impose it so heavily because that would be lust. Mm. And then to not impose anything or not to expect anything would be not lust, but would be you know, uh, 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 too lax, maybe too, too lazy. Be, yeah, maybe it could be a responsibility also. Yes. Yeah. See, you know, the, so, this Harvard example is very striking because at one level, after, you, after somebody graduates, then they represent Harvard much more if they, than if they are just students. Even as students, they represent. Right. But when they, if they're graduates, they represent much more. That's so right. Often within our movement, we don't have very clearly that kind of progression. So it's yes. almost like every devotee is expected to follow a particular standard, and which is good at one level, but uh, there, that there could be gradations and uh, different devotees at different levels can be expected to have different levels of standards. Yes. Well, I mean, look, once a, a very distressed Buckton called me up and said she had just attended, this was years ago, just attended 26 Second Avenue, a lecture by a sannyasin hmm. coming through. And of the 45 minutes he was lecturing, he devoted 30 minutes. 30 minutes to condemning homosex. Is that what the seat of Vyasa is for? No. If I had been there, boy, is he lucky I was not there. If I had been there, I would have stopped him after two minutes and said, Excuse me. Swamiji, what does your condemnation of homos, wait, you're imitating Prabhupada's word, which is not an English word, actually, homosex, and you're English, so sh you should say homosexuality. But, you know, you're up there condemning homosexuality for the last two minutes. Is this what we bhaktas are about? We are not here to condemn people, we are here to raise people. We're here to bring people into our loving circle. Now, if you don't have a loving circle, I can see why you're busy condemning homosex. Yeah. 
Anyway, he's very fortunate. He's very fortunate, Chaitanya Charan, that I was not in the audience because I don't tolerate this kind of thing. My God. You know, this is a, I think homosexuality is itself a big subject, but since you brought it up, so again, we could say that uh, we all have, we may, our standard movement has certain standards and actually even how those standards are to be applied in this context, it's also not, is we are also not clear about it right now. There are different devotees are different, uh, different understandings. But more importantly, your point, independent of specifically of homosexuality, is that you know, if we start condemning, then we are not representing Vyasa. Can you hear me? Exactly. Too? Exactly. Now, I had heard something opposite of this, that the very purpose of the Vyasa sun is to condemn the current forms of illusion that take people away from Vyasa's teachings. Now, of course, you could say that we could say that whether homosexuality takes people away from Krishna, but okay. some people do have this idea that condemning the current brands of illusion is what we are meant to do. Condemning is Kanishta. Understanding how people get distracted by the worldly forces and are moving away from their own true hearts is Madhyama. And Uttama is how to see the big picture of how ultimately everyone is a loving servant of Krishna. Now, the question we must ask is, uh, as teachers, when we sit on the seat of Vyasa, do we want to be merely condemning people? Does that inspire people? Or do we show how we understand how people could be caught up in the phenomenal world, but how they could ultimately be brought back? Which is better? That's beautiful. It is this Kanishta Madhyama Uttama. So now, again, going back to our Prabhupada hermeneutics question, we could say that yes. there are times when Prabhupada is condemnatory, maybe, and that's what sometimes comes out quite strongly in his writings. But yes. Prabhupada, in his personal dealings, yes. was never condemnatory, practically never. He was very very understanding. In fact, his personal servant, I believe his name was Nanda Kumar. I believe it's in the letters where Nanda Kumar said, Srila Prabhupada, I'm married. I, I'm not meant to be married to a woman. I'm just not. He then, Prabhupada said, then, then you, find, you find a nice boy and uh, you continue your Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada said that. I had no yes. idea. Yes. You see, it, we have our standards. Okay, the standards are there. Uh, no one will deny it. You won't deny it. I won't deny it. But what is the function of standards? How do we relate to standards? How do we help others relate to those standards? This is the key thing. We're not a bunch of mechanical automatons. Individuals need specific kinds of guidance in relation to those standards. Beautiful. Not mechanical automatons, but we need individualized guidance. Yeah. Now, yes. I remember... I was thinking that now I, I was reading a little bit about how cults are formed. I was reading about how say, some young educated people go into fanatical organizing like I like the Islamic states and other things. So then I read one person, his narrative, and he said that, you know, 
I was so happy because now I don't have to think about anything. I just have to follow and I'll be delivered. <laughs> then I remembered one time one devotee also, he said, I asked him what yeah. attracted you Krishna consciousness. He said, it made my life so simple. I don't have to do anything except obey my authorities. Well, then I correlated, maybe in the first few years it is good, but if we have a very, yeah, right. if we have a oversimplified understanding of Krishna consciousness, then we may think of Krishna consciousness as simply like ticking a list of bullet points. And if anybody is exactly. not ticking those points, then they are wrong. Exactly. But there's so much more to Krishna consciousness than that. Yes. Yes. Actually, Krishna consciousness is made for human beings. Not merely devotees. 